I wanted to talk with you a little bit this evening about the scriptures and about this theme that's been assigned for this uh, Wednesday um, about thirst. And the message is called thirsty. And I think that's a question mark behind there, isn't there? Thirsty? Are you thirsty? So that's a good question in the light of the gospel, which we read, and in the Old Testament lesson, which we read. Very good reader, by the way, Thomas. The Old Testament lesson is the continued history of the Jewish people as they've now moved out of the land of slavery, headed toward the promised land. And they didn't get to where they are in this Old Testament lesson easily. They had all kinds of problems, as you remember. First of all, Pharaoh of Egypt, when Moses came to him, he said, well, I don't think I want to let you go. And then God intervened with the so-called plagues. We know about some of those. By the way, did you know that the plagues, such as frogs, lice, flies, all of those things, do you know that those are also gods worshipped in the Egyptian theology of old? Isn't that interesting? So someone has made the comment that the plagues are kind of a, oh, a god swipe at the gods of Egypt. Very interesting. Nonetheless, they finally got out of there by walking across where there should have been water. There wasn't any water because God dried up the Red Sea. So they did get out finally. And now they run into a problem. Uh, We're kind of picking it up in the middle here. But if you read chapter 2 before, you find out that after they left the land of slavery and got in finally to the desert for their long journey, uh, they ran into trouble right away. There was no water. This is the second time they run out of water in the desert. And there's another time coming up that they don't even know about. But nonetheless, the first one was they get to the um, uh, plain of the wilderness of Shur, S-H-U-R, I think it is. And they find water, but it can't be uh, taken. It's not potable. It's sour. It's bitter. It's not drinkable. And so they complain to Moses. (laughs) Moses says, well, why are you complaining to me, you know? So Moses prays to God, and God says, well, take some sticks and throw it in the water. I'll clean it up for you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, He threw the the wood into the water, and I don't know how it happened, but God's miraculous intervention for sure. Now they could drink the water, and they were happy. After that, God blesses them with, uh, what is it? Well, manna we know about, and quail, so they have some flesh to eat and all of that. Then they run out of water again. This is the second time, right here. Exodus 17, and this happens in the plain of Rephidim, Rephidim. and uh, it's a problem, and it really is. You've got all of these hundreds of thousands of people, evidently, and no water. They're going to die, and they complain to Moses again. Why have you done this to us? Moses says, I didn't do it. God did it, you know. So Moses prays to God again, and you know what happens. The Lord says, okay, Moses, take that rod I gave you. Remember that rod? We read about it last week. Moses took the rod, and he threw it on the ground, and what happened? (laughs) Snakes, all that stuff. But at any rate, same rod. Now he picks it up, and the Lord says, go over to that rock and strike it. So Moses goes over there and bangs the rock with his stick, and water comes out. The people are happy. God has taken care of water again. The last time recorded in, for instance, Numbers chapter 20, is when they get to the wilderness of Sin. I love that, S-I-N. Sometimes pronounced Zin. But nonetheless, same thing happens. This time, God says to Moses again, after Moses, you know, complains and all, go over there and strike the rock and I'll give you water. So he goes over and, and instead of, Uh, excuse me, I didn't say that right, go stand in front of the rock and, you know, speak to it, tell it, give water, something like that. And so instead of doing that, Moses goes over with his stick and strikes it. And then the scripture says very subtly, because of this, Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land later. That was the big sin. Interesting, isn't it? But that's for another day. The point is that God provides water. You know how long you can live without water, approximately? Three days. No, longer than that, maybe, if you had a drink before. <laughs> but, you know, seven days, maybe. 
You can live without food for a long time, but not with water, not water. But nonetheless, it's the essential. And in this Old Testament lesson, we see how God has provided for his people by giving them a wonderful drink of water. Marvelous stories. Yeah, they kept complaining. Exactly. They didn't even know it was coming. But nonetheless, here's the point about, I mean, there are lots of points about this. I just want to talk to you a bit about it. This gospel lesson for today from John chapter 4 talks about what? Water. Now, you know that story. Uh, it's, it's just got all kinds of interesting points to it. Oh, that you could take any one of them and go, you know, for a week sermon if you wanted. First of all, Jesus, the Jew, comes to the well at noon. It's about noon. It's the hottest time of the day. And he and his disciples have been walking from the south, north, and they have to go. Th the, the scripture said they had to go through Samaria, as if that's mm, too bad. They had to go through Samaria. And most Jewish people of that day would have felt that way. They just didn't like Samaritans. And by the way, that's not just something that happened. That's got a 700-year history by the time Jesus comes along. That's another, another wonderful story. Why did they not like each other? But nonetheless, they didn't. So they come to the well. Jesus sits down on it or near it. And uh, here comes, guess what? A Samaritan woman. That's logical. This is Samaria. She lives in Sychar. That's where this well is. And they uh, began to talk, and Jesus breaks it and says, hey, can you help me? I just think that's fascinating that in between the lines here, the Lord and Master of the universe comes to a Samaritan woman for help. She's the only person in the world that can help him right now. I mean, that's the way it seems, right? Give me some, can you give me a drink of water? And then that conversation ensues. You know, why do you talk to me? You know, we're not supposed to talk to each other. And by the way, I was reading a book about this, uh, uh, some books about it, and th this author pointed out that Jesus just broke through all kinds of stuff in this conversation. First of all, even talking to a woman in public, much less a Samaritan woman, but then you heap on it the Samaritan part of it, and Jesus is breaking all kinds of laws here by reaching out for help and assistance to a woman that he doesn't know who's a Samaritan. My goodness, the Jewish men, if they had seen this, would have just had a terrible time with it. Jesus was just blowing things away. Uh, the world was changing. And you can read about all that stuff by yourself. But so the conversation takes place, and it begins to get theological. You notice that. And Jesus says some very strange things to this woman. And you, you, I at least, I have the feeling that Jesus is sitting there with this beatific smile on his face, just, just having a wonderful conversation with someone who really needs a drink of water and doesn't even know it. And that water that this woman doesn't have that Jesus can give her, Jesus calls living water. And it isn't it interesting that the woman responds with some sort of a Oh, I don't know what it is. It's not sarcastic. Really. I think she's got quite a sense of humor. And she simply says, oh, I'd love to have some of that so I don't have to come to this old well anymore. By the way, it was Jacob's well. You caught that. Anybody here know when Jacob's well was first dug? We know. Well, not me, but we know. Approximately 1,900 year B.C., before Christ. That's when Jacob was there. And there's a history behind that well thing. But nonetheless, you can go there now. Some of you probably have and had a drink of water from Jacob's well. Anybody here? How, how did it taste? It was good. Was it cool? Do you remember? Okay, well, it was probably cool because that well is pretty deep. Some people say it's probably 70, 80 feet deep. And that's, that's pretty good pace. And the well has been gushing up clear water, you know, good water ever since. The woman says that. She said, gosh, Jacob drank from this well and his servants, and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, Jesus continues to talk to her about the water. We get into the husband stuff, and that also is kind of funny. I'm just convinced that Jesus is just pulling her leg, and she just doesn't get it. Well, you're right. You said you don't have a husband. In fact, you had five husbands, and the one you have right now isn't even your husband, so you ought to get married or something like that. But nonetheless, the woman is taken by Jesus, 
and you know that she goes, runs home, and begins to tell people she's met the Messiah. And so because of that, Jesus is invited to stay in Sychar, and then he stays a few days and talks to the Samaritans who come back to the woman and say, well, we believe that he is the Messiah, not because of what you said, because of what, what he told us and what we've come to understand. A wonderful story. And all the while, Jesus is giving these people water. We call it living water. And living water, of course, it seems to me in this pericope is a, is a, uh, a symbolic thing. It's talking about the salvation that Jesus gives. If you don't have it, you're going to die, spiritually speaking. So you need this living water for sure. And Jesus is the one who gives it. Well, I was thinking about that when we were hearing the Passion story that you read tonight. It caught my ear that three times in that Passion history that we read tonight, Jesus says to his Father in prayer, if it's possible, please take this cup away from me. If it's possible, take this cup away. Now, the cup, of course, is something that contains liquid or water. But Jesus is speaking, of course, about his suffering and death, which is just around the corner. And he's going to drink the dregs, and it's going to kill him because it's poison, because it's full of sin, and all of those things which kill God's people. And Jesus is going to take a big drink of that cup and give his life for us. You know, there are references in the Psalms uh, where it speaks of the thirst of God's Son. In Psalm 22, for instance, in Psalm 69, you can find it yourself. But our Lord Jesus Christ, who knew Scripture well and knew everything in the Old Testament there was to know about what he was to do, you know, I when I said that, it didn't even sound right to me. He knows what it is because he's the Son of God. But nonetheless, Jesus is very careful that he does everything that the Scripture, meaning Old Testament, says that he will be doing. And one of those things is that he will be thirsty. It's recorded in Psalm 22, recorded in Psalm 69, and probably other places too. So when we get to the cross, Jesus is there. And when you read the Gospels, you read what we call the seven words. And one of them in John is Jesus, in order to fulfill the scripture, said, I thirst. I think that's a fascinating thing. We think about the thirst of Jesus on the cross. Certainly we can spiritualize that. And I think it's okay that we do because everything life-giving, one might say, including Water is being withheld from the Son of God as he goes slowly and agonizingly into death. So that you and I will always have a full cup of fresh water, better than Jacob's well. The water of life, the water of salvation. Well, I don't know. Go figure. It's just so fascinating, isn't it? Our Lord Jesus Christ does everything that we need for him to do so that we will not die of spiritual thirst. And he did that by drinking those cups which took him to death so that we might have life with God, with our cups full of the water of life, a gift of God. So you can take that and work with it, make it your own, if you will. But God give you a full cup of the water of God's blessings always in your lives. In Jesus' name, amen.